Good morning, and welcome to the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Hello, my name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the Executive Vice President here at Fordham. Uh, we are very glad to be hosting this event with Students First and with our friends at the American Enterprise Institute. A little bit about Fordham for those of you uh, who don't know about us. Uh, we are a national education policy think tank based here in Washington, D.C. We do the kinds of things think tanks do, issue reports and blog and comment on all kinds of things in education reform. One thing that makes us unique, though, is that we also do work on the ground in the great state of Ohio, where we have a team uh, working on policy issues and also doing some charter school authorizing, uh, all of which uh, keeps us grounded in the real world and uh, also gives us a particular interest uh, in this report uh, that grades how the states are doing on education reform. Uh, those of you that are following along on Twitter, those tweets out there, the hashtag today is, ready for this, S-F-S-P-R-C. I did not make that up, okay? If I made it up, it would probably have, it would rhyme or something like that because I'm, I'm big into that. But uh, again, S-F-S-P-R-C. Eric, do we know what that stands for? Uh, students First State Policy Report. Okay, there you go. That's the hashtag. Now, if you see me up here on my iPhone, I promise I'm not emailing, I am tweeting. Okay, I've been known to do this before from the dice, and I'm not against it. I, I am, uh, I'm Mike Petrilli, and I'm a Twitter-holic. Okay, so <laughs> those of you out there, you know, it used to be that if you looked out in the audience, you saw people on their phones, you thought, oh my gosh, we've lost them, they're all bored to death. Now I just like to believe that people are tweeting instead. So that's what I'm going to choose to believe if I see you on your phone. Uh, okay, we are here to discuss uh, the Students' first, uh, first Annual Policy Report Card. Uh, now, many of us up here know what it's like to put together one of these big 50-state report cards. Uh, we at Fordham have been grading states for 15 years on a variety of things. Uh, Ulrich and Rick, who I'll introduce in a moment, have been involved on a project called Leaders and Laggards. Uh, it has some similar uh, dynamics. There's, there's other uh, studies out there that have done this before, and we all know how hard it is to do. And the, the challenge is that when you try to look across the whole landscape of education policy or of school reform and boil it down to a grade uh, and to be very comprehensive. Uh, first of all, it's a ton of work. 50 states. Sometimes we thought, man, if we could just have 10 or 15, it would be so much easier, you know, if we were Canada. But 50 states is tough and it's tough to do this process without uh, losing a lot of nuance. On uh, every one of the issues that this report looks at, uh, there are nuances. Uh, there are specific things that us policy wants to want to get into the details on policy to design. And yet, uh, you can't get into all of that nuance in something like this. So the report we're talking about today is not perfect, and we'll talk about some of those imperfections. I hope you don't mind, Eric. Sure. Uh, but it's uh, a, a heck of a, a heck of, of an attempt to try to decide which states out there are really leading the charge on education reform. Uh, and to my eyes, when I look at this report, uh, and, and even though you can nitpick on the specific indicators, when you step back and you look at the states that come out on top, the so-called reformiest states in America, uh, they're the right states, right? They're, they're the states that those of us in the education reform community hold up as exemplars. Uh, Florida, Louisiana, Indiana, Rhode Island, Colorado. Uh, we say, yeah, that looks right. And when you look at some of the states that did the worst on this report card, like <clears throat> uh, California, for example, with a big fat F, I believe maybe the only state in the country that's not a rural state to get an F, you say, yes, that looks right too. Um, so, uh, so just looking at that, it certainly seems like they've gotten the, the big picture right in this report. Well, we're going to hear about the report in some detail, and then we're going to have this uh, really star-studded panel dig into it and talk about its pros and cons, and, and more broadly about the reform agenda going forward. We're going to talk about uh, some of the issues that have been raised out there in the blogosphere. Uh, the bloggers uh, have not been shy about raising questions about this report, uh, and we'll, we'll put them uh, to Eric and to others on this panel. For example, People have noticed that uh, the state of Louisiana, for example, does very well in this report, and yet it is not known to be knocking the socks off of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, right? And uh, vice versa, you've got some states that get Fs uh, that do quite well on NAEP. And so the question is, hey, uh, what does this mean? Uh, does this report card even measure the things that matter in terms of raising student achievement? Or uh, are we worshiping false gods here in the, in the reform movement. We're pushing for policies that may not be related to student achievement. We're going to talk about that. Uh, 
we're also going to talk about the use of test scores. One thing that you'll see throughout this report is that students first, you guys love test scores. And you want to use it in all different kinds of ways. Um, measuring teacher effectiveness, measuring teacher preparation programs effectiveness, uh, informing parents, holding schools accountable, on and on. And we'll ask about this. And in, in, in this point where we are in, in education policy in 2013, uh, do we really need a greater focus on test scores? Is that the, the way that we want to go? Uh, or are we worried about this overemphasis on testing? We'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about whether the agenda that is behind this report is even the right agenda for most of America's schools. Is this really an urban education agenda? Maybe appropriate for the Washington, D.C.'s of the world, uh, but not so appropriate for the Idaho's or the North Dakota's or the Vermont's, uh, much less for the typical schools out there in the suburbs. So we'll talk about it. And, we'll, and then we'll drill down into some of the specifics in the pillars that they talk about on teachers, on choice, on spending. Uh, where did students first get it right, wrong, and again, how can we uh, get this uh, more accurate going forward? So a ton to cover, a great panel to do it. I'm super excited. So let me introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, we have Eric Larum. Uh, now, Eric is the Vice President of National Policy at Students First. He is the mastermind behind this report, and I can't imagine how many hours you spent putting into it. Um, and before uh, he took on this role at Students First, he was the Chief let's see, the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Mayor for Education in the District of Columbia. It reminds me of my title when I was at the Department of Education. Good, we love those government titles, but yes, a staffer working on education issues out of the Mayor's office in D.C. Uh, and then uh, joined up with Michelle Ree at Students First, and Eric's going to give the presentation today. Uh, next up, we have Eric Smith, uh, who is the Executive Director of Chiefs for Change, also well known as the former Florida Commissioner of Education, uh, also well-known and well-respected superintendent of many large systems, including nearby Anne Arundel County, Maryland, uh, once upon a time. Uh, and, and Eric's going to especially talk about the experience of Florida, one of the states that does very well on this report card. Next up, we have Tom Luna. You know, Tom, I, I, I was hoping that, that you might have gotten into the dictionary this year. The, the, the phrase Luna Laws, now known to those of us in education reform, uh, it's quite an honor to have uh, laws named after you like that. Uh, but Tom, the uh, super, state superintendent in Idaho, I recently stepped down as the president of the Council on Chief State School Officers. Uh, we served together in the George W. Bush administration uh, a long time ago. Uh, and Tom is going to give his perspective from Idaho, uh, but in, and also tell us a little bit about uh, his travails uh, this fall and a big fight that happened uh, there over some of the reforms that he had helped get enacted. Next up, we have Rick Hess, uh, who, by the way, is wearing a tie. Let everybody notice it. Pretty impressive. Yeah, pretty now, he's wearing jeans, though. Uh, Tom, you weren't supposed to tell us about the jeans. Rick thought he could get away with the jeans because he didn't think people would see. He did not realize that here at Fordham we are about transparency, and there is no skirt you can see right through to the jeans. Sorry, Rick. Uh, the lack of a jacket, though, is, is pretty transparent uh, all around. So, yes. Uh, Rick, as you know, directs the Education Policy Program at the American Enterprise Institute, is the author of approximately 1,200,000 books, uh, including uh, his, his new one that's just about to come out, uh, Cage Busting Leadership. Um, which is a phenomenal book and is about pushing superintendents and other leaders to use the authority they already have to improve their schools. Is that fair? Is that, is that about right? Yeah, spot on, babe. Spot on. And Rick and I, for something like seven years, have been co-hosting the Education Gadfly Show podcast. If you don't listen to that, you should be. You are missing out on a lot of fun. 20 minutes a week, you get your fill of education and wonkery. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, Ulrich Bozer at the Center for American Progress. Hold on, Ulrich, I should get your, your title here. Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Very good. Uh, Ulrich also, as I mentioned before, was, uh, was the brains behind the operation over there when they put together their Leaders and Laggards reports. Uh, he has done several of these state uh, report cards. He also worked at Education Week on their Quality Counts report. So he's been around this block a few times on grading state policies. Also put out a fantastic report uh, looking at efficiency and spending, um, and so we're going to get Ulrich to weigh in on some of those issues in particular. He's also a published author who, unlike uh, some of us up here, uh, whose, whose books have, a book actually has sold well, uh, I think the trick is the book was not about education policy. Uh, 
but it was about a uh, an art uh, thief. That's and that's yes. Correct. Yes. All right. <laughs> Note to self. Note to self. Okay. All right. So those are the introductions. Uh, lots more in your packet. Now we're going to hear from Eric about the report itself. Please welcome Eric Laram. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, it's fantastic to see everybody here uh, to, uh, to talk about our report card, to have a conversation around the state of education policy. Real quick about Students First, we are a national uh, advocacy organization. We're active in 17 states, but we're obviously focused on education policy across the country. Uh, and our mission is to change policies across the country so that they are uh, focused on student interests and putting students first. Um, what we did with the 2013 state policy report card, we wanted to uh, achieve two main objectives. We wanted to first start, of course, with, with setting a benchmark. Uh, we want to make this an annual project. Uh, but the first objective was to generate awareness. Uh, typically, when we start talking about education policy, folks are uh, very familiar with education from their own experience in school, maybe their child's experience in school. But when you start to talk about state policy, eyes sort of glass over. Uh, definitely a disconnect uh, in terms of how state policy impacts uh, student achievement, how it impacts uh, schools. So we wanted to generate awareness around what we think are the right policies, uh, strong policies for students, uh, state barriers that may be in place that prevent schools, strong leaders from doing what they need to do. Uh, the second was we wanted to take that awareness and then translate that into action. And so uh, creating a roadmap for change, a roadmap for reform that policymakers can use uh, to figure out how they can get their state from where they are today to one that puts uh, students uh, at the center of all their education policies and also to give advocates, parents, community members something that they can go to, to legislators and ask for specific changes to their state laws and policies. <clears throat> um, in terms of our methodology, we, we created a rubric uh, for the policies in our policy agenda, uh, came up with a zero to four scale, and then we set about to look at uh, all of the state laws and regs that were in place. We also looked at uh, policy practice. So there are some states that were able to put uh, policies into uh, place for the state they did it without taking a vote. They did it without actually uh, you know, having a legislative body pass it. But uh, Rick may call some of those leaders cage-busting leaders, really, if, if, they, if they were to, to, uh, to sort of make statewide policy and just make it happen and get it done. We wanted to give those states credit for that as well. Uh, so that's, that's how we went about scoring the states. Um, we did it according to our policy agenda. Of course, we are uh, an advocacy organization. We have a point of view. Uh, I think this week that has shocked uh, some folks. But uh, it definitely shows up in our, in our report. Uh, we have three main pillars of our policy agenda. When we think about these, uh, we're really looking for levers that we think are going to lead to transformative change. So uh, we like to think of it as broad in scope, but certainly not comprehensive. There are other things that you can focus on, but we think that these are key levers for change. The first is elevating the teaching profession, really talking about leveraging uh, the power that we all know a great teacher can have in terms of changing uh, life outcomes for their students. Uh, how do we take that power? How do we take those great students, make sure that we are keeping them in the classroom, that we're rewarding them for their, for their hard work, uh, that we're doing everything we can to attract and retain them into the profession. Empowering parents with data and choice. Uh, at the end of the day, I think parents are most, uh, you know, best positioned to make the best decisions for their children. We want to empower them with the information so that they can make those, uh, those right decisions. Uh, we're talking about school information, uh, classroom performance information. And then, of course, they have to have choices. For me, choice is a great equalizer. Uh, you know, far, uh, far too many parents uh, are limited in terms of their choices depending on their income or maybe where they live. That shouldn't be the case. Uh, with choice policies in place, you can open those, uh, those choices up and give more options to parents. Spending wisely and governing well, uh, you know, we have limited amount of resources to spend. Uh, we need to make sure that they're targeted toward the classroom, they're targeted toward what works, and uh, make sure that <laughs> schools and districts have the flexibility they need to serve the students they actually have. Uh, and do it in innovative ways. And then we need to hold leaders accountable for the, uh, for the performance and raising student achievement. <clears throat> so you know, after we did our assessment, this is, this is what we ended up with. And for those of you who haven't seen the, uh, the state map yet, uh, we have uh, two states uh, that earned B minuses, Louisiana and Florida. Those were the top graded states in the country. Uh, none of the states earned an A. Uh, some folks have remarked that we're uh, maybe perhaps tough graders. I think that's probably the case. We didn't apply a curve. Uh, we wanted to accurately reflect uh, where the state policies were today so that, again, we could start about the conversation about how we change it. So, you know, looking at the country, um, again, Louisiana and Florida with B minuses, you have a handful of, of Cs. 
Uh, the over two thirds of the states uh, receive D's and F's. If you're thinking about the D states, uh, what's interesting to me is that in a great number of these states, there actually are policies that are being adopted. You're starting to see movement. You're starting to see momentum. Um, so despite the low grade, uh, I think a D actually indicates that there's conversation and there's actually progress being made. They're, those states are taking an incremental approach, perhaps, to education reform, but they are engaging in it nonetheless. And then these are the states that were left with the Fs. As, as, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, most of these are rural states, and I think that's something that, that we'll talk about today. Um, California sort of hanging out there. <laughs> um, you know, this, this next slide, I wanted, when, we, when we wanted to approach the policy report card, we wanted to make sure that, again, we did reflect our, our whole policy agenda. Uh, there are uh, you know, a lot of things that would make up sort of a comprehensive approach, but we wanted to provide as broad of an approach as possible uh, in terms of grading the states. I think there are a lot of great reports out there that delve into specific policy areas. Uh, you know, NCTQ does a great annual report on teacher quality. National Alliance for Charter Schools really tells us about charter policies, but there aren't, uh, to my knowledge, uh, you know, a single report that, that does as broad of a scope around all education reform policies or, or the ones, at least in our policy agenda. We thought that that was important because as, as there is no silver bullet to fixing schools, uh, we can't just do it with more charter schools or uh, with just improving teacher quality. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were looking at whether states were approaching this in a comprehensive manner and were, were trying to tackle as many uh, policies as possible. Um, so, you know, when we looked at this and we looked at the top 10 states for each policy pillar, we found that no single state was doing everything uh, extremely well. In fact, among the top 10 for each policy pillar, only two states, D.C. and Rhode Island, make the top 10. Uh, and, and frankly, that's because the empowering parents uh, pillar, the overall grade is so low that you can get a D plus and still make the top 10. So uh, every state has a long way to go. There is much, uh, much more work to be done. Key findings overall, I think the, the first finding is, is in line with what many others have said uh, before us. Teacher quality policies, uh, you know, those tend to represent the most amount of change over the last few years. A lot of states are putting in teacher evaluation policies in place, uh, improving those systems. Uh, charter laws, we're now up to, I think, 42 states that have charter schools. Um, and so that, that is certainly uh, making, making those policies widespread. Um, the other thing that, that jumped out to us that was really great to see is that these are real policies. These aren't pie-in-the-sky policies. So, uh, you know, it, of the 24 policies that we measured in our report card, uh, you can find those policies in action in at least uh, one state across the country. And in fact, 21 of the 24, uh, we found states that were meeting our gold standard, our highest score. So these aren't things that uh, are unreachable. States are leading the way in terms of education reform. Uh, they're getting it done, and there are models to point to that other states can follow. Um, you know, this, this question of whether there is a predisposition uh, for local control among states that then leads to a lower grade, I think that that is a question Mike raised. I think it's one that we should discuss today. It definitely played out in our findings. It wasn't something that we uh, sort of set about in our rubric when we first designed it, uh, but it definitely came out. And this rural rejection, this idea that, uh, you know, are, are rural states uh, sort of rejecting these education policies, or is it that we, are, uh, we need to think about how we approach uh, you know, rolling out these policies, implementing these policies, adopting them at the state level, do we need to come up with a different approach uh, to answer the rural question? Uh, I think we'll get into some of these pillar findings uh, through the conversation. I did want to pause on the empowering parents uh, pillar for just a moment. I mentioned that the overall grade uh, was fairly low. I think that, that that happened for two reasons. One is that there are a number of policies in there uh, that we think are innovative. We think that they are uh, solid approaches to go in terms of, of putting student interests first but they are ones that are relatively new among most states. Uh, one being parent trigger, I think we've all heard a lot about it. Uh, only four states uh, have fully adopted it so far. Um, and parent notification, which is you know, notifying uh, uh, parents of children who are placed with an ineffective teacher. Again, there are, I think, three states that are, that are doing that now. Uh, we think that it's a policy more states should adopt, uh, but it's one that's, that's uh, you know, sort of just starting out. The other, the other piece of this, this pillar is that we tried to set a high bar um, in terms of uh, charter accountability, for example. If you look at that, you look at uh, charter accountability. Most states, I think, reflects what would have been strong charter accountability uh, for laws maybe several years ago. We're trying to focus more on authorizer accountability um, at this point. And so we, we tried to make it a little harder to get a high grade in this pillar. Let's skip ahead to um, some, other, some other findings. We, we, of course, once we were done with the data, we wanted to ask ourselves some other correlation questions that would come up. So, you know, the first one that comes up is whether or not, uh, you know, these are policies that are just adopted by 
uh, you know, states that are right to work states versus uh, union states and, and how that plays out. Um, you know, it, it, to be honest, I think once we, we looked at that, it was sort of a toss up. If you look at the right to work states versus union states, um, it's, it's a bit of a wash. It's pretty much equal in terms of their GPAs. Uh, the strength of the teachers unions, excellent report that the Fordham Institute uh, released not too long ago. Uh, that one was interesting in that uh, it seemed that if you were at one extreme or the other, you had a higher GPA. It was the states in the middle in terms of their union strength uh, that had a lower GPA. So um, I actually don't know how to explain that one. I'm hoping that, uh, that Mike might give us some insights uh, into that one. <clears throat> um, of course, the next one is you know, the, the reform agenda itself is a Republican agenda. Uh, it's a right-wing agenda. It's, it's something that you know, we're sort of only doing uh, for conservatives. I think if you were to look at the governor's party, who is uh, the governor who's in power right now, uh, you would find that, that, sure, states that have a Republican governor have a higher GPA. However, if you were to go to how we typically divide states up in America, uh, on our 24-hour news channels at least, red states versus blue states, you'll find that overwhelmingly the blue states have a higher GPA uh, than the red states. And so to me, it, again, this one sort of ends up being a bit of a toss-up in terms of, of, uh, of you know, the, the political party that's, that's behind the reforms or supporting the reforms. I think these are bipartisan uh, in nature, mostly because they're common sense policies to begin with. Um, <clears throat> we did, of course, want to look at, at student achievement, only because we knew the question would come up. Uh, you know, the, the, the question being asked about uh, you know, how our grades compare to states with certain NAEP rankings. Um, I, you know, to me, it was sort of self-explanatory. If, if a state is at the bottom of the NAEP rankings, they would be the first states to adopt reform policies. Um, so I think that that was a, the, the, sort of the first answer that came to mind. The second was that if you're looking at 2011 uh, NAEP scores and then you're talking about grades that are given for policies that for the most part have been adopted since 2010 and beyond, uh, there, there really shouldn't be a correlation. Um, that was certainly what we found in terms of our, our analysis. But just in terms of how we, we are looking at Massachusetts and New Jersey and perhaps how we would explain it, um, I think the first would be that when you look at the uh, proficiency rates in those states on the NAEP, you'll, you'll find that uh, you know, both states have a majority of their students who are, who are not proficient or below proficient uh, in eighth grade reading. Uh, while the rest of the nation was narrowing the achievement gap, the achievement gap was growing in those two states. Uh, that certainly played out in more rural states as well. And so finally, then, we're, we're left with looking at uh, the example that Mike had mentioned earlier, which was Florida. Uh, Florida is an interesting state because it is really the, the only state that you can look and have uh, perhaps 10 years worth of information in terms of adopting new policies and also 10 years worth of, of student assessment information. And our quick look says that, uh, you know, despite factors that may be in place that, that others would say would contribute to lower uh, student achievements such as higher poverty rates, uh, higher uh, populations of students of color, higher ELL populations, uh, lower median, median income, uh, Florida was able to catch up uh, to the rest of the nation in terms of NAEP performance. And again, Florida was able to uh, exceed the rest of the nation in terms of gains. So, you know, if you're, you're talking about the, 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 uh, the theory of change that we have in place and that's behind the, the uh, policy agenda itself, um, you know, if you're talking about removing the state barriers that are in place that keep schools, uh, keep district leaders from doing what they need to do, and you want to put better policies in place, um, you know, I think that we can look to the policy agenda, we can look to this report card uh, and see how things break out. Um, and then what we would want to do is look for the next five years and perhaps even the next 10 years in terms of data. And what we would expect to see is that states that are adopting these policies are going to see growth in student achievement, they're going to see narrowing of the achievement gaps, and they're going to see that happen faster than states that don't adopt the policies. That's it. Thank you. Well done, Eric. And, and not even using up your whole time. That was Great. fantastic. We will give you an A- minus for that. You know, we're, we're a little upset at Fordham. We, for a long time, have been proud of our reputation as being tough graders. And Checker is pretty upset that uh, you guys may have surpassed us on the tough grading. Okay. So I will try to throw out some grades throughout the, uh, the rest of the event just to, to take that back. All right. Lots to dig into here. Um, let's start with Eric Smith. Uh, and, and let's talk about this Florida issue. It does seem like Florida is the one example reformers like to hold up. It says, hey, if you have these kinds of reform policies in place for a long time, you will see big gains on NAEP. Uh, is that fair? Tell us that story. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, great report, great, uh, great work, and I think it's 
very informative uh, in, in general for you know, for all state leaders and and uh, and the general public to really dig dig deeper into these issues. I, I think one of the the you know we have seen some some I think some pretty dramatic success in in Florida over the last decade since the late 1990s really. When a lot of the the reform effort started with Governor Bush uh, and his his uh, his leadership in the state, and we, uh, I think one of the strong messages that, that come out of uh, the work in Florida is that state policy, federal policy matters. It really does matter. It is not random. It's not uh, accidental. But it, it, it thoughtful, specific, focused uh, issues that are that, that are discussed in in this report. Uh, state policy matters, and it can matter either in the benefit of children or it can matter in the to the detriment of children. So uh, how states put together the direction, one of the key things that I found as I worked in Florida for, for four years as state chief um, was that it does help to define what's important within the state. What, what does the state think is, is most important in, in, in terms of the work? Uh, uh, and, and being able to define that, that the focus on children, the success of individual children, and not some but all children, is a critical, critically important piece. It's what we're about in terms of public education, and how do we play that out in state policy? So, there's a translation, there's a crosswalk that goes between uh, a strong, uh, unwavering belief and commitment that every child has an opportunity to success for success, and and so what kind of policy promotes that and uh, encourages that within a classroom, a school, a district, and across across state state boundaries? We we have uh, so in you know. Our work in Florida, we, we had a, just an unwavering focus on outcome. It started it out in the late 90s with a, a, a very clear uh, definition around school accountability. And uh, 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 as was mentioned in this report, talking about under the section where they're talking about uh, 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 parental choice, uh, the, the transparency or how you communicate what's going on in the school that your child is attending. Uh, what kind of what kind of information does a parent need to be well informed to make a judgment about is this the place that's going to serve my child the best and and so forth? Uh, in Florida, with the school grading mechanism, and I'll tell you that the power of that uh, is uh, is is absolutely incredible. So, uh, you know, the the accountability piece, uh, uh, the, the transparency piece, the public awareness piece uh, around that, and. And also built into that uh, effort in Florida was was an, an incredible sense of urgency. Uh, the grades were coming <laughs> every year, and like 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 waves on a beach. And you you, you just uh, you you need to be constantly preparing for uh, and, and improving your operation, uh, and not just in overall performance, but in gain scores. How are you doing with your lowest performing kids? Are you no matter what, no matter how good or affluent a school is, but how how are you doing across the the, the board? And all this is a focus on individual students, uh, which I think you know, student first uh, just just underscores the, the need for, for that. Uh, final thing I say about a little bit about the Florida story is that if you if you dig into the Florida Florida legislation and policies, you'll find that find that they're comprehensive. And so, ten years uh, when we're back here, uh, well, I won't be maybe in ten years, but when some people are here. The younger Eric comes back in 10 years and talks about the 10-year snapshot of where is this, what's this report card look like then? Well, yeah, in my view, it's going to be very important. Is not 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 were you messing in your state with uh, teacher quality policies and did some stuff because adults love to work on the process. Well, we've got stuff in legislation. Well, what stuff? Well, we we've got some evaluation pieces. Well, is it connected up with your employment decisions, your 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 compensation decisions? Well, we haven't quite gotten to that yet. Well. You haven't done the teacher quality piece or the or the or the leadership quality piece yet, uh, and you've fallen short, and so your results won't won't be as, as significant as if you have comprehensive educator uh, quality uh, educator uh, reform in place. And I'm probably running out. Of, I'm taking Eric's time also. So um, uh, your so, name's Eric. Yeah. So it's okay. <laughs> we're, we're both. That's right. So. You know, the comprehensive nature of these pillars is, is critically important, and we found that to be the case in Florida. It's not just that you have a state accountability program. It's what's your metrics within that accountability program. What do you value? Is it important that your highest-performing school also shows significant gains with the lowest-performing schools students within that school? And Florida defines that as a priority. If you don't, you won't be in a school. So uh, how th these details matter a great a great deal, and the co comprehensive nature matters a great deal. Uh, a co constant focus. That's one thing I'd, you know, I you I I thought I was going to have a hard time as commissioner in Florida because so much work had already been done. 
And I learned that we had just begun, although we had done a, a great deal, that uh, constant vigilance, constant, constant uh, pedal all the way to the floor, uh, 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 constant movement uh, forward and, and challenging. That's why, again, holding up a report card that says you're a D, I know you've probably had some conversations with state chiefs that, that say, I really want to know why. Not because I want to argue with you that I should have been an A, but I want to know why because I, I need to know what I need to do to become an A. And so that's the kind of that, that constant uh, criticism of yourself and, and uh, introspection is, is, is important. Uh, there there are, are just a couple of pieces I'd, I'd say, you know, Florida has seen results uh, that I think are uh, that tell the story about uh, well thought out state policy and the impact on individual children's lives. Uh, starts out with uh, if you want to just take the snapshot of state accountability, state measures, state assessments, the FCAT and so forth, you, that's, that's one measure of showing progress. Our NAEP scores have gone up dramatically. We used to be at the bottom nationally on NAEP back in the late 1990s. Uh, we've, 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 we're, not, we're not good yet, but we've, we've seen dramatic improvement in our NAEP performance. Uh, just recently this year, we we uh, we chose, and, and there weren't a whole lot of states that chose to do this, but we chose within our race to the top funds to uh, administer some international measures because we wanted to know how we were performing internationally rather than do this psychometric crosswalk from NAEP to whatever. And so we did it. And I was assuming I was going to get fired on that. No one knew what was in there. And when we did it, we'd be doing terrible. And they'd ask me, why in the world did you put that in there and make us look so bad? Well, it turned out uh, I was, I'm no longer there anyway, but, uh, uh, but, but the results came out and in fact, uh, Florida did extremely well on, a, on an international basis also. So I think, uh, you know, that that is, that's, you know, evidence that we need, but you take advanced placement where we were in 1990, in the 1990s versus uh, early uh, 2010. So. Uh, graduation rate, uh, still long way to go, but great progress being made by all subgroups. So these are the kind of things that ultimately policies, how are you doing, what's your grade, and then the real question is, is if you have a good grade, what are you getting in terms of student achievement as a result of that? Thank you all very right. much. Thank you very much, Eric. Let me, let me push a little bit. Uh, just the other day, uh, Matt DiCarlo uh, from the uh, Schenker Institute wrote a post saying, you know, trying to analyze this claim that the Florida reforms have led to this huge achievement. And of course, there's no way with state policy to prove these things for sure. And, and the tough thing in Florida, it was so comprehensive. You did so many different things. And some on the, sort of the anti-reform side will say, hey, I, it, was, it wasn't the accountability. It wasn't the school choice. It wasn't the teacher stuff. It was lower class sizes. It was more spending. Uh, it might have been some other kind of fluke. Maybe something changed about the student population. I mean, what, what gives you confidence that there was this direct line between the state reforms in Florida and these amazing results that we've seen? Well, because you, you, you see, as, as commissioner, I, I could see them empirically. I could see, I could see uh, the impact of state accountability directly on, on the performance of kids. And when you, tweak the, when you made a tweak of the formula, for example, we... Under my, my term in there, we, we did a pretty significant modification of the high school accountability program. And I can point specifically to the changes in kids' lives, thousands of kids, tens of thousands of kids' lives because of those changes in, in state accountability. They, they draw a straight line from uh, whether it be graduation rate, we had some progress. You see the high school, high school accountability change, graduation rate jumps dramatic downturn uh, nationally, and Florida certainly was right in the middle of that. And uh, I never had a budget that was more than the year before. I never had a department that was bigger than the year before. And uh, uh, so we, yet we pushed incredible reform agenda, teacher quality, educator quality, other kind of things through. And we saw uh, a, a tremendous spike in, in the performance of the state and the performance for kids. So running parallels between these things uh, is, is pretty risky. I, I certainly can drive it through accountability, teacher quality issues, policies, uh, around that at the state level. Okay, all right, thanks, Eric. Okay, Tom, you are next right. for the treatment. Okay, uh, when, when we look up here on this map. Do I get, do I get a grade? Uh, oh, Eric, what, what grade should we give him? Uh, I don't know, I see you were pretty good. I, I don't want to give a too high a grade, okay. Eric. Okay. No You'll be judged no at the end. Okay. Yes, no ways, yes. Uh, so, Tom, when we look up at this map, we say, wow, what is going on there in the Great Plains? Uh, though we do notice that Idaho escapes with a D instead of an F. Uh, but most of the other states that do poorly, Alabama, West Virginia, Vermont, New Hampshire, and then the Great Plains. And we say, okay, 
uh, either the rural states just uh, are adamant against reform, or maybe this reform agenda is not a good fit for rural America. Uh, so you're from Idaho. Last time I checked was a mostly a very rural state. Yeah. Does this reform agenda make sense in places like Idaho? Yeah, I think the places where this, uh, this report focuses on, I think that it transcends um, – uh, populations, whether it's urban or whether it's densely populated states or or uh, a state like Idaho. Idaho is uh, geographically very large. It's surrounded by six states in one country. Uh, but but uh, we only have 1.5 million people, about 280,000 students, and 700 schools. Uh, there's many school districts in America that are considerably larger than the, the whole population of Idaho, right? So. Uh, but when you look at uh, what this report focuses on, on highly effective teachers, on empowering parents with knowledge and with uh, choices, and also with uh, fiscal accountability, I think that those three areas of focus are um, Im important uh, areas of policy when you're looking at reforming education, regardless of whether it's a, um, uh, a rural state like Idaho or not. Uh, when, when you look at the, you, you made mention, uh, Mike, earlier about the laws that we passed in 2011 that, that then through referendum were overturned in November. <clears throat> I'll try to get that lump out of my throat. <laughs> but, uh, I told Tom, no crying, okay. no crying. But the fact is uh, those were the three areas that we focused on in, in uh, the uh, reform laws that we passed was, uh, was highly effective teachers. Uh, we refer to it as great, great teachers and leaders, transparent accountability, uh, 21st century classrooms. Uh, interestingly, if you look at uh, what Idaho scored before November on this report, I think if you look at the state rankings, we were number 18. Then after our laws were repealed, we went down into the low 40s, I believe. Uh, so a, a bit discouraging, but you're, you're, to answer your question, I think those are the areas that you focus on, that, that those three areas, uh, regardless of whether it's a rule, uh, state, a rural school district, or uh, uh, urban, uh, or metropolitan. All right, but, but some will say, look, you just can't do school choice in rural America like you can in a big city with dense populations, with transportation. That's true, right? Well, if you, if you limit school choice to brick and mortar, yes, but through the miracle of technology, school choice is available to more and more. Uh, and uh, we do have examples of where charter schools are opening up and flourishing in, in very small communities of, of just thousands of, of people, uh, so or with just hundreds of students. Uh, uh, I'll give you one example. I won't name the school district, but we had a school district that had four schools. None of them ever made AYP. Uh, now, yeah, I don't think AYP is in and of itself the only measure that determines school uh, uh, quality or, or student achievement, but it is the, the, the statewide standard measure. A charter school opened up in that community. It was a brick and mortar charter school, divided the community, it was very disruptive. Uh, two years later, the charter schools opened and all four of the traditional schools met AYP. There's a reason. It's because it, even in a small community, uh, the, the giving parents a choice drove even the traditional schools to improve because they knew they at least that, that parents had a, another choice and, and they needed to find out how to, to uh, meet the demands of parents in order to keep them in the traditional school. Okay, great. Okay, again, your grade will be given at the end. All right. All right, I want to keep the pressure up here. All right. Uh, Rick, I uh, want to talk some about the policies around parental empowerment uh, and your thoughts on, on how uh, students first came at that. You've done a lot of work on creating more uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems and the like. First of all, Eric, why, why don't you go and, and tell us, maybe you get to that, those slides too, but give us a little bit of detail and context in case not everybody in the room has studied this in great detail on, on what exactly you were looking for when it came to parent empowerment. Sure. Uh, so when we think of empowering parents, really two major factors. Uh, the first is whether they have the information to make the choices. So we're talking about school performance and classroom performance. Uh, and so uh, are you uh, putting out A to F report cards for your schools and school performance? And are you looking at notifying parents when their child is placed with an ineffective teacher? Um, and then, of course, parent trigger is, is sort of in there as, as a control. Um, and then uh, the choice factor breaks down into uh, voucher programs, uh, charter schools, 
uh, and then how well you're supporting both. Do you have funding comparability? Are you giving them access to facilities uh, and facilities resources? And for both vouchers and charter schools, a very high bar for accountability. We wanted to make sure that that was a part of both of those programs. All right, so Rick, have at it. Uh, Can sure. you please get right up on those that, that microphone? Sure. Uh, there you go. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first thing is, you, you know, um, one, of the th one of the things I particularly like about this entire exercise is the degree to which students first is clear and unapologetic about where they're coming from. Nothing drives me crazier than when people are doing these report cards uh, and they, they pretend to some kind of faux objectivity. Um, you know, look, we, we, all, we all have theories about what's going to serve kids well and what's going to make schools better. And I think it is admirable when we are clear and explicit about those. It makes for a much more honest and useful conversation. Um, second, I think the metrics they use uh, are generally smart and creative. Um, and I probably, you know, uh, much of this I am very sympathetic with. I'm probably on the same page for about 70%, give or take, of the metrics. One of the things that's a little frustrating to me in all of these conversations, nothing unusual in this one, um, is the degree in which both kind of self-styled reformers and self-styled uh, teacher advocates uh, tend to talk about reform measures uh, with an implied uh, universality and, and a sense that they know what works. Now, it's possible that everybody out there is much smarter than me because I, I seem often to be the only person in these rooms who's actually not confident that I know what works or that if something seems to work, not confident that it works everywhere for everybody. So that, that is relevant because I find myself, in a, when I read something like this, very sympathetic to what Students First is doing, very sympathetic to the scoring, but also much more hesitant than the report is that things that seem like good ideas are going to be good ideas everywhere for everybody. Let me give you just a couple examples. Uh, one. On balance, I'm sympathetic to the parent trigger. I think parent revolution is a neat group. Um, I'm not at all confident parent trigger is a good idea. Um, I think our experience with site-based management, most famously in Chicago 20 years ago, pointed out a lot of the pitfalls uh, with these kinds of ideas. Um, I have no problem with legislatures adopting parent trigger. I think absolutely we should be experimenting with it. But I am hesitant in marking somebody down at this juncture for not being on board. Uh, similarly, parent notification about teacher effectiveness. Um, I've got real qualms. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, we, we've just seen what's happened with structured uh, teacher evaluations in Florida. Um, after all the fuss and muss in 736, turns out less than 2% of teachers are still rated ineffective. I'm not at all confident that value-added metrics are particularly good and reliable gauges year to year of whether their teachers are good or not. So sending parents form letters telling them their teacher is good or not based on these things strikes me as premature. I don't have a problem with a handful of states that are trying it, trying it. It's a free country, and that's how we learn. But I am hesitant to mark somebody down at this point for not being on board. Uh, second place where I've got some hesitation um, is, as Mike noted, there is a lot of emphasis placed on uh, reading and math scores uh, in various points in this report. God knows I'm sympathetic to that. Um, I used to be somebody who was regarded as a big testing advocate about 10, 12 years ago when the conversation looked different. Um, I feel like I've stayed more or less in the same place and the conversation has moved pretty significantly in the past decade. Um, I, I think it is good and useful to factor in achievement data, but I worry, for instance, about telling states in order to get an A or, uh, uh, in, in order to get an A on uh, grading of schools, they need to be using an A to F format. Uh, which relies on both growth and, uh, and level-based scores and which emphasizes achievement gap closing in particular ways. To me, this is far more prescriptive than I think we ought to be or than we know to be at this point. About, I, I, I'm entirely supportive of the idea that states should grade schools. I'm perfect, personally fond of the ADF model, but I'm hesitant to be that prescriptive in how we think people need to do it. So, Rick, you would be an easier grader. <laughs> is that fair to say? Uh, I mean, you, you, would, well, you would look at state policies and you might be more lenient in terms of saying, well, ADF is great, but so might these other models. So, so actually, yeah. And, and what I would say, when Ulrich and I worked with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce a few years back on these leaders and laggards report cards, one of our ongoing conversations is I'm actually less eager to loosen the, grit, loosen the uh, grading schema and actually more concerned that we grade folks positively for moving away from anachronisms of the past. 
So I like creating room to recruit talent more effectively. I like create, I, I love what uh, Students First did here about making sure, uh, about grading states up when they are funding charters equitably and giving new schools um, access to facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about grading tough there. Where I'm concerned is about using grades to be much more prescriptive about what do you do in this new world that we're trying to gravitate towards. Okay, good. Eric Lear, why don't you respond a little bit to what, what Rick just said on the parental empowerment piece? Sure. I mean, I, I think generally uh, Rick's criticisms are fair, and they're certainly they're, they're fair criticisms. They're certainly ones that we struggled with uh, in developing the rubric and then setting out and looking at the various states and, and what comes back. You know, the questions around whether we are too dogmatic in our approach uh, around A to F grading is certainly one that, that comes up. Uh, like you, we have a preference toward uh, A to F versus, uh, you know, zero to 100 or uh, the colors of the rainbow uh, or just making up new descriptions of schools. We wanted to get at something that was accessible to parents, uh, and we think that's the right direction to go. Um, you know, I, I, th I think where we, frankly, where, where more nuance needs to be played out in that uh, and, and whether that makes us even more dogmatic or less, I don't know, but is in looking at the quality of the accountability system behind the A to F grade. Uh, I think that that is, uh, you know, something that is, that is definitely, uh, you know, something we want to focus on and look at over the next year. And, of uh, course, the, the, I mean, th you know, this is what the big ESCA waiver debates is all about. Right. I mean, it's all this gets very wonky, but, you know, what exactly are we holding schools accountable for? In Florida, they focus on the low achievers. Do we look at subgroups? How does that all play out? And, you know, who, what, what, what does it take to deserve an A? What does it take to deserve an F? That, that gets very nuanced. The question is, you know, how much are we comfortable with different states reaching different decisions on that? Yeah. I think that's right, but I think for us, start, starting with the general principle that they have to provide that information that they need, the state needs to come up with, uh, and again, this needs to be statewide. It can't be uh, certain districts have uh, you know their version of a report card authorized or whatever. You need one statewide system that all parents can understand and compare. Uh, I think we would you know agree that there's a starting principle there. Um, uh, you know, in terms of the other policies, whether they are uh, premature or not, I think is also uh, you know a fair question. Uh, again, I think our point of view would be the state has a role to, to, uh, to set the policy. We think that it's generally in the right direction. We think that a lot of these are common sense in terms of parent notification. The idea that once you have this teacher uh, performance information, it, it's incumbent, it's an obligation that districts use it, um, you know, not only to drive their personnel decisions, but parents would want to know. Parents need to know that. They want to know that information. There's not a parent. Uh, in this room who, who, if they knew the district, could tell them whether or not their teacher is effective. They wouldn't want that information in their hands. Uh, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, that's, that's where we came down. But again, I, I don't think any of this is off base. I think it's something that we want to look at and see how it plays out and see what states are doing over the, the course of the next year and think about whether we need to apply more nuance to the analysis. Okay. I think Tom wanted to get in here. Were you going to defend the rainbow system? Was, was that? No, not the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I, what we have in Idaho is a five-star rating system, and we debated the A to F or five-star, and we felt that five-star was even more contemporary and definitely for the younger generation something that is there, it's more user-friendly for them This when they're looking for any number of consumer uh, things that they consume in their lives. Uh, five-star is something that is, is used uh, uh, in the marketplace, if you will. And so uh, I, I agree with Rick. I think it's, it's kind of odd that, uh, that it would have to be A to F and that another way of di differentiating school performance is, is not acceptable. I think that's a little too prescriptive. Uh, we, we, we made the choice to go to five star uh, for the same reasons that other states chose to go to an A to F. Okay. All right, let's move now to spending wisely, governing well. I want to get Ulrich into this conversation. Again, Eric, why don't you give us the recap on, on the kinds of things you were looking at here? Sure. Uh, so this policy uh, pillar is a fun one in that it's, uh, it's, it's a hodgepodge. Um, we, we've got everything in here from mayoral and state uh, control, so whether or not you have uh, accountability mechanisms in place, triggers in place that allow uh, districts or the state to change up the governance of who's governing districts, who's governing schools. Uh, and then, uh, you know, everything related to uh, how resources are used, ensuring that flexibility is at the local level, uh, that districts can enter into management alternative agreements with each other, uh, that they uh, have to report out their expenditures in a way that links expenditures to student achievements so that we can finally understand not just what we're spending, but what we're spending it on and what we're getting for those investments, uh, class size restrictions, and finally pension reform. 
uh, is, is you know, a big thing that states are wrestling with. It's something that we wanted to look at in this as well. Okay. Ulrich, have at it. Sure, sure. So I'm going to start uh, here by saying, you know, imagine my wife and I want to buy a new car. Me, I like speed, right? I like fast cars. I like motorcycles. I want to go skydiving in the next few months, right? So if you put in front of me a BMW, a Volvo, and a Mini Cooper, and I had to rank them, I am going to go for the BMW. That would be my number one choice. If you talk to my wife, talk to my wife, safety is her number one issue. She sounds more responsible. She sounds far more responsible. We have two little kids. She's terrified of crazy DC drivers. (laughs) Safety is number one. The Volvo would be the number one spot. I want to say that, like, you know... So are you knocking the Mini Cooper across the board here? You can go for the Mini Cooper. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering, is this an implied dig at the Mini Cooper? We all want to see I'm Rick in Mini Cooper. Against, I'm do. not against Mini Coopers. I'm not particularly in favor of BMWs. My point here is that all these are pretty good cars, right? They're reliable, they have reasonably good gas mileage, are comfortable to sit in, maybe more so for uh, some than others. But who is doing the rankings makes a huge impact on the rankings, right? And I think that's really important to keep in mind here, right? That students first, kudos to them for being transparent. And this goes to Rick's first point, being honest that they're ranking these states. But really what we're looking here is at their values as they approach, you know, these states. I think this is particularly important when we dig into this spending wisely uh, governing uh, category, right? That it is itself this hodgepodge. And there's some some things within this to, to, to like, right? So one, for a long time in education, we have just simply ignored the idea that we need to spend wisely, right? A, a lot of districts have uh, just spent and spent and spent without much results to show for it. So, and I think also making sure that spending wisely is connected to governance is, is key, right? So from an intellectual, from a theoretical framework, I think they approach the issue wisely. But I think also in this category, there there is a lot of issues, right? And one is just not looking at the issue of equity, just not looking at, uh, as if I understand correctly, it's only really looked at in charter schools, but we have these massive uh, spending gaps between high, high poverty and low poverty districts. I think the second issue I would look at in terms of spending wisely is that this basket of indicators really emphasizes flexibility. And I think that's a good thing. I think we often have two... Our funding systems are simply too prescriptive. But that that alone is simply not enough, right? I mean, just giving superintendents more flexibility is not going to suddenly magically make them spend their dollars more wisely. What are we doing to offer them the correct incentives? What are we doing to offer them the correct tools, the correct training? And when you think about your average, um, you know, school superintendent, is he going to turn to his chief financial officer for advice? I mean, right now, chief financial officers in most school districts are accountants, right? They have no sense of what is the vision of the school district going to be? How how can we use the dollars that we currently have to uh, produce better outcomes? And so I I think this just sheer emphasis on flexibility in in my my mind is is narrow. Um, And I think, you know, this is an issue throughout the report, in, in my opinion, and it's just not enough focus on outcomes. Not in the narrow way that I think Rick uh, was eloquent about, right? Not just talking about reading and math, but when we look across this report, we don't see who is actually uh, improving over time in, in NAEP. You know? And we look at states like Maryland uh, and Massachusetts that have shown uh, improvement over time. Eric talks about looking at improvement over time in terms of the state. So why isn't that currently included in this report? And I think that's particularly highlighted in this category, because while it's called spending wisely, there's actually no data on whether or not the states are spending wisely or not, right? There's no money, there's no information on the actual dollars spent, and there's no information on the dollars spent relative to their their outcomes. And this is an issue both on the policy side, so we've seen states like Texas be very smart recently in terms of evaluating schools and districts on their productivity, and uh, got a great deal of attention for it in, in a very thoughtful way. And that also is not included, right, both from the, the policy side and the outcome side. So I, th- I think in a report like this and also for this basket, what we see is that for advocates, this is a, this is a good thing. For people who, excuse me, and for the advocates who support Students First, this is a good thing, right? It allows them to benchmark themselves against their framework. But I think for skeptics, for people who uh, are not supportive of the Students First agenda, You know, my sense is this actually does very little to convince them that this is the right set of of policies. 
you know, the other thing for me I should just say is that, you know, if you do know of a very fast car that's very safe, <laughs> you know, it would be great if you could, uh, you know, tell me about it. Let me drive around in it a little bit. I'd appreciate it. Like you need to talk to the NASCAR people. I, sh I should talk to the NASCAR yeah. people. Now, I, they also need space for two kids in the back. Ah, NASCAR yes. has, has a bit of an issue with that. All right. Eric, uh, to respond to that, he, Eric says this is a hodgepodge. It's a bit, bit of a hodgepodge, yes. And is, is it just that we, we don't, we haven't made as much progress in the policy wonk world on what to do about school finance and governance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think his last comment uh, is exactly on target. There is no data on uh, you know, whether districts and states are spending wisely. Um, and so you know, having a fiscal transparency policy in place uh, and grading states on whether they do uh, is, is you know, we think, critical. It's, it's uh, a part of of where we think state, states need to go. We highlight uh, Texas as, as sort of a model for that, um, but we would like to see more states doing it. And I think Orca is right that you need to tie that to accountability. I think you know, th this, this sort of larger point that he's making with, with the metaphor, which uh, you know, I like um, as, as a car enthusiast, but uh, you know, I don't know if it quite fits here, and that is that uh, I don't know that we're, we're trying to convince skeptics uh, I think skeptics have their minds made up, but I think that the, those are extremes that are that are you know very polarized. I think there are a lot of folks in the middle who just simply do not know what the education policies are in their states. And so whether it's the spending wisely pillar, teachers, anything else, the policies in the states, if we can have the discussion about whether it makes sense to lay off your uh, best teachers before you lay off your uh, you know teachers based on seniority, if you can have a conversation about whether or not you should require uh, school leaders to come up with uh, you know, assigning teachers based on solely uh, class size numbers that are set at a state level and not looking at what the individual needs on the, are at the school level. If we can have a conversation about what those policies are, uh, you know, I, I disagree. I actually think that a lot of folks will realize that these are solutions, that they're common sense, that they just, what's in place right now in most states doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, but let me push on this a little bit, Eric. I mean, w would you admit that there are some policies in here that we have more confidence in than others? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, Rick made the point earlier on, on parent trigger and whether we have confidence in sort of what, what happens at the end of the parent trigger process. Uh, I think that that's, a, that's a, a fair question. I don't know that, that every policy uh, at this point, look, we're, we're, you, you're not going to innovate um, and you're not going to get to new territory if you sort of wait to only uh, innovate based on what is already proven. It's, it's sort of self-defeating. Um, you know, I also think that there are policies that, that need to disrupt the system. They need to sort of shake things up, change the, uh, the power dynamics. They, they need to shift the balance a little bit. Right now, what we've got is a system uh, and a set of policies that are designed to protect the system. Uh, and so, you know, whatever we can do to, uh, to change that and focus it on, you know, what's going to get results for kids, mm -hmm. that's what we'd go for. All right. Tom, you want to get in here? Yeah, I'd just like to bring a r rural perspective to this. Um, uh, particularly, for, for example, uh, I think in the comments that were made in, Idaho, in reviewing Idaho's laws that uh, Idaho should consider uh, mayoral t control of low-performing districts, uh, I, I think uh, when you look at rural Idaho, you 50 percent of our school districts have, have less than 600 students, and uh, many of those students come from multiple communities with multiple mayors. So that's not a model that's going to work, right, in, 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 that, in most of the, of the school districts in Idaho. And most of those mayors uh, are part-time, and some of them are, do it for free, right? So I mean, it's, it, it, it's not a, a model that, that we see happen in other parts of the country that would work in, in the majority uh, of Idaho. I, I do think, though, that this is one area that requires tremendous focus, and that is how are the dollars that we currently have, uh, how are they being spent? Because the focus uh, in, in the discussion is usually on how much more do we need? And I've, you know, I've been involved in education at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, there's never a time where I said, take some of this money back. We can't figure out where to spend it. And I mean, we're always looking for more sources of revenue, but that discussion has to include how are we spending what we currently have. Um, one thing that Idaho has done is we are now publishing a fiscal report card where parents and policymakers and 
taxpayers can go and they can look at their individual districts and get answers to some very basic questions. What is the average per pupil spending in my district? What is average teacher pay in my district? What percentage of the money in my district is spent on administration versus the classroom? And how does that compare with every other district in the state? Just that step alone is going to drive, uh, I think, the kind of results that we're hoping to get when we talk about wisely spending uh, funding. So, so, so I think there are ways to do this. Uh, again, I think this might be this, uh, you know, talking about mayors taking over schools mm -hmm. in in a, in a rural part of the country is probably not uh, a f necessarily, um, uh, uh, you know, right. an option that should be that should be part of this report. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there are ways that you can inform. Uh, and, uh, and you know, when it comes to how dollars are being spent. You know, it'd be interesting, Eric, if, if you, you know, you're, you spent all this time on this report, but it'd be kind of fun to go through and take some policies that maybe aren't good fits for rural America to just take them out of the scores for those rural yeah. states and, and see what might happen. That might be interesting. Eric Smith, why don't to get in here? Yeah, yeah just a, a couple of points on, on this, this particular section. Uh, one, uh, a lot of states are, are wrestling with the, the whole uh, concept of, of money following the child uh, from a financial model and, and uh, uh, seeing the, the, the need to get breakthrough legislation on, on how to make that work is going to enable uh, a greater access of parents to uh, uh, virtual education, uh, online uh, education, uh, promote uh, uh, trans uh, transition to charter schools and so forth. The, the, the financial issue seems to be uh, quite often a big, big, big roadblock in setting up politics that work against uh, those other kinds of initiatives. So that's, that's just one comment about this section uh, that perhaps that could have been, been uh, more of it. And I, I do have a question. You know, I, I see a lot of states that really are smart about the management of funding and give more flexibility. They would do some very, very cool things that would be great to watch and see how they, they play out. I can also probably give you a pretty long list of those that just do a pitiful job of managing funds and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, even and I can give examples of where they've been given a great deal of extra money and, and totally squander it and make the worst financial decisions possible. Not that name names, Eric. Come on. Well, name some I've names. got a few, but I'm not going to. Anyway, so but there, there are examples. So is there any notion about, about earned, earned flexibility, earned autonomy on some of this stuff, that it's not just uh, a blanket, uh, you get your, your allocation, uh, run with it, and go ahead and continue to make all your bad decisions you want, and uh, it's going to keep coming. Or whether there's an accountability. There's a, oh, yeah. Uh, it's not just free money. All right. Well, this, this is great. I want to get the audience in here in just a minute, so I'm going to keep the conversation moving a little bit. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and someone will bring a microphone to you. Let me ask one last question. There's one back there, I see. Okay. Um, let's get into this test score issue that I raised earlier. Um, are we too obsessed on these reading and math scores? We're now using them in so many different ways. Um, you know, you said that you know no parent wouldn't want to know if their teacher is effective. Well, what if uh, that effectiveness is is judged based on test scores? As a koala dad myself, uh, as opposed to the tiger moms out there, uh, you know, I've said that uh, you know at times, look, I. I I have fairly progressive instincts for what I want for my own kids. I don't want my kids' teachers obsessed with test scores. Uh, I, I mean, I, I want the test scores to be good, but there's a lot of other things I care about as well. And a lot of Americans feel the same way, that there's too much focus on testing and that it's narrowing uh, our school's focus to just these two subjects and to, uh, to kids that are, you know, under, you know, behind the curve and that it's creating all kinds of perverse incentives. So doesn't this agenda, aren't we just making that problem worse? by focusing everything, everything, everything on these test scores. Uh, who wants to tackle that first? All right, I'll let Eric go first. Sure. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, so here's, here's the thing. I, I, you know, our team at Students First, uh, we analyzed, I don't know, uh, 100, 200 bills last year. Uh, I don't know a single one uh, that, that we looked at that suggested that we do any sort of measure, any sort of evaluation solely based on test scores. Uh, you know, the buzzword that, that we're all using, and we're using it for good reason, is multiple measures. Uh, and so, so I think if we were just telling parents, uh, you know, what the, the teacher's value add score was, for instance, I think Rick's absolutely right. There's too much volatility in that uh, alone. It doesn't tell you enough about what's happening in the middle, which is where the vast majority of teachers are. Um, and so if you're just looking at that, it doesn't tell you enough information. And then the whole point is to get parents meaningful information. 
But if we're looking at uh, these assessments and we are, are uh, whether we're assessing teacher performance, school performance, whatever it is, uh, if we're doing it in, you know, using the best data available, uh, using multiple measures in a comprehensive way, uh, with a defined rubric, first of all, it's, it's way better than anything that we're currently doing in most states uh, and in most districts. Um, and second, it, it's the only way that we're gonna have information that then drives conversations about how to make the, the test better, uh, how to better measure student performance. Uh, does it have to be a standardized test or something more robust? The only way we're getting to those conversations is the states that are already tackling this. Tennessee, D.C., Florida, they're way ahead on these conversations because they've already started down this path. Is that true, Eric? You're way ahead on these? You, your, your parents are all happy. They, they don't worry about too much testing. The schools happiness are teaching a, a totally broad curriculum. Measure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, happiness is a totally different measure. But I, yeah, I think that we're seeing some, some good results. And uh, whether you talk to some of these other states that are, that are leaders in this area, Tennessee, or others that are that are uh, down the road a ways on on uh, this teacher quality work uh, they're learning a great deal but they are seeing uh, what they consider to be a direct co correlation between uh, the, the success of their kids in, in all schools and not just uh, low form, historically low form schools but but all schools and I I guess you know intuitively would you want your child to go to a, a, be in a classroom where uh, they're they're academically they're doing a little bit better at the end of the year than they were when they started or would you rather be in a classroom with your child where academically they're doing a little bit worse than they were when they started? And, and how are you going to know? And so, uh, you know, I would, I would think, you know, there is a fair amount of research around, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're with a, a very, very, very bad teacher in, in mathematics or whatever, and, and you, you, you run that road for a couple of years, your chance of recovery is, is, is really, really compromised. And so uh, I think... Uh, uh, just simply intuitively, you would think that there would be some place in a, 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 a principal, a teacher's evaluation, that it would be appropriate to talk about uh, student learning, and uh, uh, rather than just simply school classroom environment, uh, are parents uh, well informed? Uh, is, is the discipline good, and so forth? Right, so, right. But is this creating a narrow focus on just reading and math? Um, yeah, we, 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 we know yeah, those yeah, things yeah, matter, yeah, but they're not all that matter, we've, right? And, and we've, 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 as commissioner, I wrestled with that. You know, in, in high school, we, we expanded our, our metrics for high school. What do you define as an, as a, as a high school? And it includes a, 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 variety, a, a broader array of message, uh, of metrics uh, that uh, just simply mathematically, that's not the purpose of today's uh, uh, panel, but uh, it makes it much more complicated in terms of, of communicating with parents exactly what's going on. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, reading is, uh, is is a critical skill, and math is a critical skill. And if we fail at that, we fail at, at, at most other things a child might not want to try to do. So, I think uh, I think uh, at this point in America's evolution of this work, I think these are the right measures. Okay, Ulrich wants to get in here. First of all, are you a warm and fuzzy koala dad as well? Uh, yes, yes, I would I would count myself. I don't know if I'd quite use koala though. Uh, <laughs> Well, you don't care about your kid's safety, so that's a problem. No, I, yeah. I care about going fast. That's kamikaze? Kamikaze dad, maybe? Different. I mean, the, the point about the outcomes that is clear here, though, is that you know, there are states that have shown significant increase um, on NAEP, like Massachusetts and Maryland, who have clearly very different reform models than the ones that do well uh, here. And I think that's you know, really important to, to, to keep in mind, right, that there is a reform agenda being, being pushed here, and there are different models that have shown uh, on NAEP, some, some, some clear success. The question, though, about are we too focused on reading and math, I think there's just some issues that we really need to unpack. I mean, one is the quality of the exams themselves that I think embedded in your question, right, is this just total focus on this cheap approach to testing, which is multiple choice. And so, uh, you know, when you say are we too focused on reading and math, when you look at the data where only, you know, 2% of high school students currently uh, are scoring at the advanced level in, in math, it's hard to be like, well, actually, no. What we need to do is not emphasize that anymore. Uh, we need to, you know, uh, roll back when we're not actually achieving, uh, even by our own standards or against international standards, at the levels that we want to. But I think, you know, better exams when we unpack that issue are going to be key, and we can sort of, you know, right. tickle up the race to the top and all that sort of stuff, but I think most people here are familiar all with right. the hopes and dreams of better exams. Did you say Good. tickle up? Uh, tickle up, race to the top? I, I was going to say, you know, uh, uh, frame it up, but I think I may have said tickle. So okay, okay. Tickle. we're tickling. Okay, we're going to uh, tickle our fancy with some questions from the audience. Uh, okay, right here, and then in the back. 
Next one. Tell us who you are uh, and please ask a question. Keep it short. My name is Lee Yang. Uh, I'm a PhD in economics by training, but I've been through the system uh, from local to federal or even to global. What I try to say is the current system, people really forget the meaning of education. So if you just say a focus or test, that's good. The problem is propaganda will say that it's bad because they want to recommend somebody who has no quality at all. That's ruining our system. But we have to promote the education, okay. meaning everybody have a good education, have good capability, and have a good use of their potential. The second is about the data. So t t t uh, please go ahead and ask a question. My question is, is all about this problem, about the data accountability, about the real use of resources. They okay, may let, use let's, that's good. Let's go with that, okay? Because we got a lot of people who want to ask questions. So who, anybody want to tackle that? Tom, you look like yeah, you did. I, I, think, I, I think it was a continuation of this conversation about tests and uh, your, your and I'm a koala grandfather, <laughs> so just to let you know, and uh, that's a lot better than a koala dad. I'll yeah. just tell you when All you right. get there, it's uh -huh. great being a great parent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I, I will I will tell you that uh, that uh, I, I that I do believe there should be a focus on STEM, uh, j just because if if our job is to educate children so that they can uh, so that they can reach their full potential and en enjoy the American dream like we enjoy it. It's obvious that STEM uh, subject areas are critical skills and knowledge that students must have uh, in, in order to succeed in, in the world that we live in. The, the emphasis on tests, I, I can just give you an example that we had in Idaho. Uh, when I ran for office the first time, I heard a lot of pushback against tasty teaching to the test. We have too many to tests. And, and so the first thing we did is we pulled educators to, together, large group, and talked about First, how much testing are we actually doing? We listed all of the statewide tests that are required. And then we did something interesting. We, 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 we voted as a group in the room and then, then polled across the state teachers. Not one of those tests received a 50% majority who wanted to eliminate it. My point was that they all saw value in the test. It was what the results were being used for that created the resistance. What level of accountability are we tying to results of tests? That's where the, the pushback began. And, uh, and, and so I think that has to be part of the conversation. Uh, and I do think that, uh, that uh, student performance using multiple measures is a critical component in measuring the success of any education uh, system at any level. Great. I want to say for those of you watching online, you can tweet us a question. Again, it's hashtag SF. SPRC, by the way, that hashtag is now trending nationally. Very cool. That means lots of people are tuning in and following along. Okay, we've got a question right here. Hi, um, I'm Terry Taylor, and I'm with Education Council here in D.C. Um, my question is the extent to which you looked at the capacity of the state to implement the policy. Um, some of the states that scored quite well are pursuing really aggressive timelines with their new policies that may mean that things are happening more quickly than people are ready for them to happen. Yeah, great question. Uh, so we didn't factor it into our grading. Uh, it was definitely one of those, as we did the research uh, multiple times, we sort of leaned back and, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, the key here is the policy, setting up the right policies, putting them in place is only the first step. It's a major hurdle to cross in most states, but without a doubt, the implementation uh, is key. Uh, I think that we would look to, uh, you know, start looking at states and their implementation, how far they are in that, how well they're implementing the policies they do have. Um, that's something we would want to start looking at in the next couple of years. It wasn't something we did in this report, but it's absolutely critical. You're right. Great question. Okay, over here. Adam, um, Adam Petashek with the Foundation for Excellence in Education. Uh, this question is for Eric Laram. Um, you talked about pushing parent trigger because it's not proven, but you want to do some disruptive and transformative things. With that thought process, why didn't you do more digital learning as far as not just digital learning instruction, but maybe freeing up uh, textbook dollars for tablets or things like that will help in a yep. lot of your metrics? Great question. Uh, it, digital learning is, is definitely part of our policy agenda. Uh, at, at the end of the day, when we, we, we started out over the summer and, and did our own analysis uh, of state policies that were in place, and what we found were, were two problems. One, we didn't think that our rubric quite had the, the nuance. Uh, necessary to capture the, the right information. Uh, and two, we weren't getting a full enough uh, amount of data 
uh, we didn't think we could come out and and run with uh, you know something that was accurate and fair. And uh, you know to to uh, FEE's credit and Digital Learning Now, uh, you guys have uh, Digital Learning Now puts out a, a great policy report card on that. Until we felt like we had uh, something where we could contribute to that and we could come out with something that was fair, uh, we just didn't do it. We want to do it with the 2014 uh, report card, but it didn't make the cut this year. Okay, Ann Hyslip, uh, are you here, Ann? Are you watching online? She must be watching online. It's very exciting. Uh, she wants to talk about teacher pension reform. What can we do to uh, the challenges states are facing? What, how, how did you grade states on the pension piece, Eric? Sure. Uh, students first. Uh, the pension reform piece, we're really looking at portability and whether or not states are allowing districts to offer portable plans and whether or not then they're, they're going the extra step uh, to requiring districts to, uh, to offer uh, portable plans. Uh, and so, you know, when we first, uh, I think, started talking about this policy, and I think when a lot of folks talk about the policy, they think of it in terms of resources and whether they're better resources or better uses of funds. But when you really look at it from the teacher perspective and whether or not you're able to, to attract and retain the, the, you know, teachers into the field, uh, you know, current teacher uh, pension systems, uh, you know, they've locked teachers out of uh, their benefits, uh, the, the employer contributions, until uh, many years in, until they vest. Uh, they lock teachers into the state in which they're in. They have to stay in that state. They can't move around uh, until, you know, in most cases, until they're 40. And so you have a situation where a teacher, if they move states, they're going to lose half of their earnings that are due to them. Uh, if they move up into a leadership position, if they go into a nonprofit and into another part of the education sector and are still contributing to education but are no longer in the classroom, they can, you know, uh, lose even more. And, and states are banking on that, too, which is, is sort of a perverse uh, thing about it. So... So we're really looking at, uh, you know, what are states doing to, to, to fix that dynamic and move toward a more portable retirement plan? Okay, okay. question back here. Hi, I'm Christine Matthews. I'm a survey researcher. I um, am very interested in connecting um, this report with the real world, and I'm directing it, I think, primarily to Tom Luna. Um, I took a look at the Bennett Ritz race in, in Indiana um, to talk about pedal to the metal, and I did a big case study on, on how... Um, that election came down. Tom, Luna, do you have um, advice for other states in terms of what happened to the referendums in November? You guys did the right thing through the legislature and then the referendums. Do you have some real world advice? Yeah, because we've, we've had some time to think about it, right? And uh, I, I will tell you that our, we, we had a great uh, political strategy. Our, our, our goal was how do we get this comprehensive reform uh, through uh, uh, and convince 105 people being the legislature and one governor, right? Uh, and, uh, and and our, our, our thought all along was that uh, we're going to get just as much pushback if we do one part of reform, if we do the whole thing, so let's do the whole thing. And then through implementation, we would have the time to get more and more believers. Um, we, we, you know, we didn't get the time. It immediately went to referendum and, and we had a political strategy but we did not have a, a strategy on how to uh, deal with this in a campaign type of, a, of an environment. Uh, in Idaho, you can be governor. It costs about $1.2 million to fund a governor's campaign. The opposition to these laws spent $4 million. Uh, we've never seen anything like it. Um, and, and so we were not prepared for the kind of uh, money that came from the NEA, uh, which was about 95% of the funding. Uh, and, uh, and and so, like, like I said, I guess the advice would be to uh, to consider what laws you have in in your state, and if you have a referendum possibility, then you probably need to rethink the strategy. And it has to be more than just a political strategy to get it through a House and Senate Education Committees off the floors into a governor's desk. How are you going to quickly convince uh, 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 tiger moms and koala? fathers that this is good for their schools because you have a short period of time to convince them that this dramatic change is the right thing to do and it's easy to convince somebody let's slow down let's go back to the table and start over which is basically what uh, Idahoans uh, were uh, were said through their vote Let, let's keep on the politics issue just for a moment I'm curious you know one thing Eric said was that there was a huge amount of activity in just the last couple of years and so a lot of these states grades have gone up because especially efforts on teachers and on charter schools. And there's been a bit of a debate here uh, in Washington about who gets credit for that. Uh, does the Obama administration get credit? Is that race to the top? Uh, or does the Republican Party get credit? 
Republicans came in in 2010 and swept a lot of state houses and governors. And, and does that explain? I'd be curious if the panel uh, wants to give credit or blame uh, to either of those well, parties. I'll, I'll just say real quick, when we passed the laws, everybody took credit. When they, they were defeated, nobody wanted to take credit. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking! That, that's the politics side of it. <laughs> Rick, what, what do you think? What's your take on this? Uh, well, I mean, so there's a couple moving pieces here. I mean, I think certainly the Obama administration uh, deserves substantial credit um, for – deserves substantial credit for uh, folks pushing some of the stuff in the legislature to getting these bills rolling. Um, clearly, though, you know, a, a lot of that was kind of priming the pump. What you found was much more enthusiastic uh, legislative pickup. Um, both with Republican legislators and with Republican governors uh, after the 2010 wave. Uh, more interesting to me, though, is that, that I think we often wind up placing too much weight on the policy piece. I mean, I think, again, what Students First has done here, I really admire. A, they were straight about where they're coming from, and B, uh, they're largely a policy-focused organization. So it's right and appropriate that they focus on the policy piece. But um, a, a, as Eric pointed out, when this stuff hits metal, it is really easy for, for policy to either overshoot or to lead the horse to water and not have a drink. So we had these enormous fights in Florida a couple years ago about Senate Bill 6 and then Senate Bill 736. A huge amount of, of the a, a advocacy was premised on the widget effect report, which showed that only about 1% or less than 1% of teachers uh, in, in, in district after district were marked as ineffective. You go through this entire, uh, this entire, uh, you know, whirling gig. Uh, you mandate thousands of hours of observational protocols uh, for assistant principals and school administrators looking at teachers. They have to use Marzano or Danielson framework. We're spending tens of millions of dollars. At the end of it, we identify around two percent of teachers is not effective. Um, this suggests to me that it is very easy to put way too much weight on the policy change in and of itself and far too little weight on the other behaviors that have to change along. Rick, you don't think 98% of teachers are effective? No. I mean, that's possible, right? It's probably very possible. I don't think it's the case. All right. Oh, Rick, is this a Republican agenda that Students First is pushing? Um, I think if you were to line up their specific initiatives and look at it across sort of state houses, I think you'd find a, a, a high degree of alignment. I think that there's also some centrist uh, Democrats who also agree with some aspects uh, of the report, but I think there are some aspects of it, like vouchers, where the research is clearly mixed, and I think from a public policy standpoint, you know, frankly, I think it's a, a bad idea, and I think uh, most Democrats and most people on the left think it's a bad idea. So uh, I think, you know, you, when saying, you know, is this a Republican agenda, you kind of get into this bigger issue of what is the Republican agenda within education, because it really sort of changes the, the focus given the way that education politics have uh, played out. Okay, no, Eric Smith. I, I just got, you know, I work with this stuff like all the time with, with uh, the Chiefs for Change and other, other, other roles I have. And I, I, I find this to be, uh, you know, very, you know, bipartisan support for this kind of work with teachers and so forth. And I, and I, I find it to be extraordinarily helpful uh, and productive for our children. You know, this whole, this whole notion about students first, for Pete's sake. Well, is that a Republican agenda or a Democrat agenda, for Pete's sake? It, it, it's an American agenda. It's a, it's a, it's a mom and dad agenda, and it, it, it better be agenda, the agenda of both parties. And, and so, uh, it, and what I see, in fact, in, in reality is that it is. It gets, it gets played out in a different way and in a different locale. But I spend a lot of time with Democrat and a lot of time with Republican uh, uh, leadership, and and I see both both uh, you know, gravitating to this kind of kind of direction. And I and again, I see that as a very very encouraging sign for our nation. So where where I would just jump in, I want to push back on both uh, Eric and Ulrich a bit. Is you know when I it's interesting because Ulrich's you know not unreasonable to characterize some of these things as. as associated with the Republican leadership, um, particularly the voucher piece. But for instance, the report gives credit uh, for vouchers that are targeted for low-income populations, uh, not for universal vouchers. Uh, the report explicitly gives states uh, four points uh, if they're looking at, at achievement gap closing. Now, one of the things that, that I have often wondered about in the context of Idaho's uh, referenda 
or in the Bennett race in Indiana or in much of our reform conversation is it strikes me that we have very much made school reform in the past decade uh, something about trying to improve uh, graduation rates and reading and math scores for our nation's most disadvantaged children. And it strikes me we have spent remarkably little time and attention talking honestly about how do we make sure that middle class or affluent children are well served, actually are getting the kinds of opportunities and supports that we would like them to have, and how do we actually promote excellence in serious ways even when that makes us uncomfortable because we're serving in some cases affluent or advantaged children. Rick, would you call this the achievement gap mania? I would. Mm. I would. And, and, it's, and what I wonder about is I think Eric is absolutely right that there is bipartisan support for this agenda. You only had to look at, uh, you know, a Jeb summit a month ago uh, to see, say, John Podesta and, and Jeb Bush shoulder to shoulder on these issues. But I do worry uh, that these are issues that don't have a lot of resonance for a lot of middle class and suburban American families. And I'm not sure that even if we have bipartisan support, that we have deep support. One last question from Twitter for you, Eric. The uh, Opportunity to, to Learn campaign wants to know why you did not look at funding equity not just for charter schools, but for all schools? That would certainly be one way to appeal more to folks on the left. Why was that left out? Sure, good question. Uh, you know, I think that we did look at funding equity in terms of, or Eric mentioned earlier, we looked at whether or not we had comparable funding uh, across sectors. So are you giving charter school uh, students the same funding per student that you're giving traditional public schools? This issue of, you know, equity at the district level between districts, between schools, uh, for different students. To, to be honest, I think, I think it's, it's not part of our policy agenda right now, in part because of the fact that we don't have the data on, on what it is that we're spending uh, and, and what, what that's getting. I think that answering the equity question, answering the adequacy question is where the, the uh, sort of, you know, the litigation around education uh, has been. Uh, it's where the focus has been for years and years and years. And it still hasn't answered the question. It still hasn't resulted in uh, you know, greater outcomes for students. And in, in any of the states that have had equity suits, uh, where the, you know, states have uh, been forced to, to spend more, uh, to invest more, and target those resources uh, toward low-income students, higher poverty districts, uh, we're, we're still not seeing the results we want, right? In, in New Jersey, uh, it's, it's a great example. You've got the Abbott cases that, that, you know, should have solved the equity question if that were the real issue that was going on here. And what we see is that, that you can spend $30,000 per district if you don't change the underlying policies on how those funds are spent, and if you don't change the under, underlying policies behind the systems uh, themselves, I don't think you'll ever truly realize the investment you're making. I think uh, Bruce Baker just started a 2,000-word blog post on that right now, Eric. We're going to look forward to that. We're still reading his last one. It's still, still reading his last one. I mean, but I, I do think that it is this uh, important qu question of values. I mean, I don't, you know, I agree that, you know, uh, we haven't spent m money wisely in education, but the idea that when we're going to look at equity in education funding and only look at the difference between charters and non-charters, but not look at the, the difference between high poverty and low poverty districts strikes me as, I think, you know, insincere and, and, and wrong. I, I understand your point, but I think it comes back to this issue of values, and I think, you know, uh, given the traditional um, way in which we've uh, provided education to students of color from students from uh, who are poor, um, and we've done that for so long now to sort of change the debate and say, oh, uh, you know, what we really need to do is, is reform our um, high-end suburban schools, um, I think is, is, mis is misplaced. Look, I, I think that if we continue to believe and continue this discussion around, uh, you know, the only way to sincerely uh, address uh, students who have lower income status is to make sure that they have funding equity and not talk about whether they have a great teacher in their classroom, not talk about the fact that they are trapped to go to a neighborhood school, that they have no other choice but to go to the one that is failing year after year after year. It, to me, it's, it's insincere to suggest that, that we can solve that uh, by continuing this myth that, that we just need to spend more, that we just need to put more money there when we still don't know what, it, what it's getting. I mean, we have to change the underlying policies. I think if we do that, we start to see results, uh, and then we start to have a real conversation then about, about, okay, now how do we really target these investments towards what's working? And that is going to have to be our last word today. I'm sure we could continue the conversation, and we will, on Twitter, and, and I'm sure on the blogs. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panel for a very rich conversation. The, uh, 
the video I'm sure will be available on the Students First website shortly uh, so that you can watch it again and again and again. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.